to our What's Up. And our What's Up tonight is presented by Rich Ozer. And that will be on the James Webb Space Telescope. Thanks. So take it away, Rich. Good night. Uh, if, if you can. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, well, it's nice to see you. And it's nice to see everybody here. Um, let me figure out if I could share my screen okay. and we'll get started. All right. Does everybody see that? All right, good. So uh, there's a reason I, I was uh, interested in doing this presentation. Um, I had the great opportunity to uh, go down to Redondo Beach in August and uh, spend about two and a half hours with the James Webb Space Telescope behind a protective uh, uh, glass booth, of course. Um, but during that time, I got to meet some of the project directors and uh, one of the head machinists for the project. And we, we learned so much about the construction of the spacecraft and uh, its history in those couple of hours that I, I just got uh, uh, very excited about the whole project and um, I hadn't really been paying much attention to it. Um, I went down there with uh, Alan Roche, uh, who's a colleague of mine at uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center, and uh, also Jeff Gordatowski, who lives in Redondo Beach. Some of you may know him from the Golden State Star Party. And we were invited by a former um, Galaxy Explorer high school student who used to work at Chabot at the front desk and was a volunteer there and later went on to work for SpaceX and become a uh, quality assurance engineer for Northrop Grumman after he left SpaceX. So he invited us all to uh, come and visit the telescope. Unfortunately, I couldn't take photographs while I was there because it is, you know, it, Grumman is a you know private company and they work on a lot of classified uh, projects. And so they don't want people taking photographs of the interior of any of their hangars or labs because, uh, you know, they don't want that stuff to, you know, uh, become an intelligence uh, 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 failure. <laughs> and it, the uh, security guards did not take kindly to people having cameras. So uh, we've had to rely entirely on NASA uh, materials for any presentations that we've done on the uh, Webb Space Telescope. So uh, let me advance my slides here. All right. So the James Webb Space Telescope it involves 29 of uh, our states here in the United States, 49 different countries, and 258 participating companies worldwide. And all I've got to ask is, what can possibly go wrong? So on December 18th, uh, we expect it to be launched on an Ariana 5 rocket. And it's going to be launched from French Guiana in South America. And French Guiana is adjacent to Brazil and Venezuela. Um, why French Guiana? Well, uh, that is one of the uh, main launch sites for the European Space Agency. Um, and it's been a French colony for a long time. It happens to be very well positioned for getting that extra orbital boost from the Earth's rotation. Uh, and uh, I was toying with the idea of going there and saying, man, it would just be great to watch this launch. And I go to the website for uh, French Guiana, and the first thing it says on the website is, do not travel to French Guiana. And uh, the reason for that was that they were having so many uh, problems with COVID and yellow fever and all these other uh, terrible diseases that they were advising people to stay away. So I kind of gave up on that idea. So what's the history of this project? Well, the development of the Space Telescope uh, began at TRW. I imagine many of you remember the company TRW. Uh, they were a leading aerospace company uh, back in the 90s. And uh, it was scheduled for a launch in 2007. And the original budget was $500 million for the entire project. But uh, TRW was purchased by Northrop Grumman. 
uh, they reviewed the project and realized that it was grossly underbid. And they increased the uh, required budget to four and a half billion dollars to complete the project. In the end, like as of now, uh, they've spent more than eight billion dollars, and it's really, you know, for all intents and purpose, you know, all intents and purposes, more like a ten billion dollar project. It's a very expensive telescope, and I'm going to get into why. Um, the, the cost went up so much over uh, over these years uh, uh, in a bit, but let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, the telescope primary mirror is six meters, so think about that for a second. That's a pretty sizable diameter. Uh, and the other interesting aspect of these mirrors is they're made from beryllium and coated with gold, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the telescope, rather than being a uh, visible light telescope like the Hubble, is meant to be an infrared instrument. So the optics are sensitive, or the sensors are sensitive, from orange to mid-infrared. And that's why the coating is gold, because gold is very reflective in infrared. And if we were doing a visual spectrum they'd probably go with uh you know an aluminum coating as the other visual space telescopes are uh, but in this case uh coat it with gold there's also a 21 by 14 meter sun shield that insulates the cold side of the telescope from the hot side so there's one side that's always facing the sun and another side that's always facing deep space and the optics and the sensors need to be capped at 50 degrees Kelvin, which is very, very cold. That's 50 degrees ab above absolute zero. Whereas the hot side of the telescope facing the sun is going to be hundreds of degrees Kelvin. So that temperature differential is about as extreme as you can get. And this uh, incredible material called Kapton, which has uh, a coating on it, uh, as well. I believe it's an aluminum coating on the Kapton, acts as an insulator between the uh, two sides of the telescope. Uh, there are several interesting science packages on board. There's something called NearCam, which is the near infrared camera, and it has a coronagraph, and it can be used to study infrared light from uh, distant solar systems. Uh, and at the same time, blocking the star that is hosting that solar system. So that way they could look at the, uh, the stellar disks or at the even atmospheres of uh, exoplanets. Uh, there's something called NearSpec, which is the Near Infrared Spectrograph. Um, that one is made by Zeiss and Teledyne. Uh, MIRI, which is a mid-infrared instrument, also with a coronagraph, and that's a combination camera and spectrograph, and it needs to operate at six degrees Kelvin. So how are they going to do that? The telescope is going to be at 50 degrees Kelvin, but here's an instrument that operates at six degrees Kelvin. Well, they're going to have a big tank of liquid helium uh, on this telescope that's going to be used to cool this instrument when it's in use. Um, it's also got the FGS NIR ISS, which is the fine guidance sensor in near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. And it studies a slightly different part of the near infrared spectrum from near spec. And it's used for telescope guiding as well as for science. And that one is uh, put together by Teledyne and the Canadian Space Agency. So those are the four main packages. And you can see they are all kind of encased in the same cage on the cold side of the spacecraft. And um, they're all uh, it's they're all fairly compact instruments. And there's uh, s some other views of the same uh, this, or at least three of the four instruments: NearCam, NearSpec, and MIRI. Uh, the first one obviously is an animation. The last one is an actual photograph, as is the middle one. Um, those white, I'm I'm guessing here, but I'm guessing that these white cables are actually fiber optic cables used for the uh, spectrograph. All right, so where's this thing going to live? 
Well, you know, most of the space telescopes that uh, we've uh, enjoyed over the years, such as the Hubble, have been in Earth orbit, right? And every once in a while, uh, at least with the Hubble, uh, people would go up and visit and do repairs and upgrades. And uh, that was part of the whole uh, deal with the Hubble Space Telescope. It was a serviceable instrument. But the James Webb Telescope isn't going to be in orbit around the Earth. It's actually in orbit around the sun at the Lagrange 2 point. And so here's the sun. And this is supposed to represent the gravitational well of the sun, right? And here's the Earth. And the moon isn't even really part of the picture here at all. Lagrange 2 is out here. It's a stable gravitational point uh, that is uh, about four times the distance from the Earth to the moon. And the telescope will orbit the sun like this, but the Earth will always be eclipsing the sun. Now, it's not going to be a total eclipse of the sun. If you're standing on the Webb telescope and you're looking towards the sun, what it will look like is an annular eclipse. So the uh, the corona of the sun uh, and the uh, corona sphere of the sun will always be uh, visible, but the majority of the sun will be blocked. And again, that's very helpful in keeping that temperature as low as possible. And uh, it also provides enough solar energy to feed the solar panels that are on this thing. So this picture on the left is more or less what it looked like when I paid a visit. And uh, they were testing the folding and unfolding of the telescope. And that testing is what they had to do every single time they redesigned a part of this thing. So there are people on this project who did nothing but design and test different sized pulleys because the pulleys and the cables attached to those pulleys are used to fold and unfold the telescope. It's all mechanical. And every time they changed the design or changed the diameter or changed the depth of one of these pulleys, they would install it and they would go through the entire folding and unfolding sequence. And every time they hit a glitch, they'd have to do a redesign again, and then they'd do a regression test of the entire process and go through the folding and unfolding and folding and unfolding and do it X number of times till they were certain that that new part would perform as expected. That takes a lot of time. And uh, since it was decided once Grumman took over the project that that was going to be their MO, that every time we made a change, we're going to do a full regression test. Then the uh, dollar cost of this thing uh, uh, began to rise and continued to rise. But that's the main reason the telescope has cost so much more, not only for uh, feature additions over time, but just the vast amount of testing. And why are they so concerned about making sure it works properly the first time? Because there's no way to service this thing. They're going to be sending it, you know, a, a, a million miles away from the Earth uh, at Lagrange 2 with no opportunity whatsoever to ever fix it or uh, add more coolant to it or refuel it or anything else. So it has to work perfectly the very first time. And I don't really know of many things that work perfectly the first time, but uh, hopefully this will be one of those few things. And you can see what the telescope looks like after it's been unfolded here. Um, and here's that Kapton. It's a five layer Kapton uh, shield. And uh, the antenna and the solar array and the spacecraft bus are all on the hot side. The hot side is where my cursor is down here at the bottom. And the instruments and the primary mirror and the secondary mirror are all on the cold side. And this is what the primary mirror looks like. It's segmented, right? It's got these uh, 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 hexagonal segments of beryllium and gold 
Um, I don't know if you, any of you guys have had a chance to ever pick up a piece of beryllium, but it's uh, a very strange sensation. It's extraordinarily light. You, you barely feel the weight at all. And so the beryllium is not only a very uh, stable and hard metal but, and, uh, and capable of being figured into a correct shape, but it weighs very little. So it's ideal for a spacecraft. You just have to be very careful when you work with that material because it's also deadly if you breathe in the dust. So I uh, would not have wanted to been, uh, have been the machinist on that project, right? Um, so you can see how those hexagons fit together, and when they're all unfolded, it forms a, uh, a uh, spherical surface here. And here we are with one of those segments. Uh, this is, I believe, at Tinsley Labs in Richmond, who did a lot of the figuring for the James Webb. And then each of these pieces, as well as the entire uh, assembly, uh, got shipped cross country time after time after time to uh, a, a cryo chamber on the East Coast where they would test the, uh, the uh, mirror and uh, check its wavefront under uh, conditions similar to what it will uh, encounter at uh, Lagrange 2. And each of these segments also have uh, actuators, so they could correct the uh, figure of the mirror uh, in real time. And here's a little video I'll show real quick of part of part of the unfold. <laughs> Very dramatic music. And there. Um, I have another quick one that shows the full deployment. And let me show you this.
Okay. I'm not going to, for the, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show uh, uh, more videos, but I am going to uh, quickly talk about uh, what they're studying with this telescope. So one of the first things it's going to do is study Jupiter and Saturn, because with uh, uh, infrared light, you're able to penetrate the atmosphere of both of the gas giants. And that's just as, you know, uh, just as much a test of the instrument as it is uh, the ability to do science uh, on our local, uh, our local uh, gas giants. Um, so they'll look at the temperature characteristics of the atmosphere, the great red spot, uh, even the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, and uh, all of which can benefit from study with an infrared instrument. Uh, and of course, they're easy targets, so they can immediately, you know, um, aim the telescope at Jupiter and Saturn and test the, uh, the infrared sensitivity of the sensors. Um, the, the other aspect of uh, infrared astronomy is uh, looking at first light and reionization, basically the end of the dark ages of the, uh, of the universe. Uh, we could look at uh, th the initial assemblies of galaxies, the birth of stars, formation of protoplanetary systems, and formation of materials uh, necessary for life as well. So we could be looking um, not only at the cosmic background uh, radiation or highly redshifted objects in the universe, but also protoplanetary systems and exoplanets and uh, gather more data from infrared sensors than we would be able to from, um, from visual uh, spectrum uh, sensors. So, you know, this is a quick uh, review for people who aren't aware, you know, if the, if everything in the universe is uh, moving away from us and everything else, uh, then the most distant objects will be shifted to the red side of the spectrum. So because they're moving away and the wavelengths of light are stretched, and it means that if you want to study something very, very far away, then uh, what the best way to do that is with an infrared instrument. And we can also penetrate dust clouds and uh, nebula and also dark nebula. Uh, dark nebula are, uh, are, are infrared sources that are shrouded by dust. And with, a, uh, with an infrared instrument, we can learn a little bit more about the uh, heat distribution and energy distribution within dark nebula. Um, here's a quick map of where French Guiana is for those of you who haven't looked at a map of South America, or rather French Guiana, uh, who, who haven't looked at a map of South America uh, recently. And so the launch site is roughly here. It's nearby uh, Suriname. And I'm going to skip these videos for the sake of time and just uh, jump to see if there are any questions that I might be able to answer. Um, I want to make sure we have uh, uh, enough time for that. And uh, then I will bid you farewell. I think you said this was launching next month. Is that Yes, correct? it is, the 18th. And when do we expect to start seeing some images? Um, it's going to take it several. You saw all of those unfolding steps, right? in the uh, second video. There are close to 300 steps before the telescope is operational. Yeah, that all takes and, time. <laughs> and ev yes, and every one of those steps has to work perfectly. And I'd like to point out from the what can possibly go wrong department that that captan material, which is so critical to maintaining the insulation between the cold side and the hot side. That captan material is about the width of a human hair. And uh, so not only are they worried about proper deployment from that deployment mechanism, but you don't want it to tear. And it's astounding to me that this is even possible because I can't, I can't open the shades in my bedroom without. <laughs> <laughs> destroying them right so uh this is this is really a remarkable a remarkable engineering feat um and uh so they have to get through all those steps 
what's going to happen is the mirror is going to be deployed somewhere, I believe, mid journey to L2. They're going to get the solar panels uh, deployed as quickly as possible. There's attitude thrusters that have to deploy. And obviously, the communications, they need to get deployed right away. The antenna has to be uh, is one of the first things they deploy. So solar panel and communications, and then they start unfolding the mirrors. And by the time it gets to L2, the whole thing is unfolded. And then they can start testing against Jupiter and Saturn, which is the plan. So probably uh, a couple few months, you'll start seeing uh, images from this thing. There are no cameras on the spacecraft pointing at itself. So unlike like the Mars rovers and the, there's no selfies from the James Webb. And uh, part of the reason for that is there's also no light. <laughs> and they're not going to bring a light source on an infrared telescope. So they've just basically decided, you know, we're going to go with the sensors. It's going to tell us whether it's deployed or not. And uh, we're going to trust them. But there's no visual confirmation that any of the things that they believe happened actually happened, which will be interesting in hey, hey, Richard, I got a question from the floor here. So, uh, sure thing. Richard, I have a question. This is Ken. I, uh, Hi, Ken. This, this uh, project has been delayed so long. Have any of the instrumentation been replaced or upgraded or anything like that? Not in a, not in a substantial way uh, that I know of. Um, I think that there were some uh, changes to uh, some of the infrared sensors because those were easily swapped out. But I don't believe the majority of the spacecraft had any major upgrades. They kind of decide what's going to be in those packages when they start the project. And then most of the project is uh, how to get that thing into space safely and in one piece. Um, and they kind of stick with the sensor and instrumentation uh, technology as it was originally designed. Um, it's a great question. If I learn anything more about it, I'll send a note out and uh, put a blurb in for the uh, newsletter. It was a, something I was thinking about, but I didn't have any information. We got a, we should, don't be bashful. We got another question from the floor here. Hang on a second. Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Lee. Uh, Hi, Lee. Um, if is there any control from from Earth? Uh, yes. Or all, all these uh, computerized and uh, programmed into it? Oh, it's it's very much controlled by Earth, just like the Hubble is. There's going to be uh, the actual uh, the actual targets and the missions and the science. They're going to be all determined over a 10 year period. I'm sure there's already principal investigators who have plenty of red time reserved on this telescope uh, well in advance. But there's also going to be uh, ideas that are uh, brought forward where they'll decide, yeah, let's give a week to this project here and there, right? And uh, they'll be able to use the attitude thrusters as well as the gimbals on the telescope to aim the mirror uh, wherever they need to. So uh, that's what, you know, and obviously everything has to come back through the main communications dish. Uh, so it's always going to be communicating with Earth. It's always in view of Earth. The Deep Space Network will be in constant communication with this uh, so telescope. Away. Hmm? Compared to looking at Mars, well, instance. compared to Hubble. Well, yeah, but it's not far. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's only a million miles away. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it's it'll take uh, you know 16 yeah. seconds instead of four seconds. You know, or yeah. or you know yeah. 16 seconds instead of two seconds. Whatever the uh, the difference is. Uh, but it's very much in control yeah. uh, all the time at JPL. Yeah. So, for instance, if you were to, you know, talk about Mars, for instance, communicating to and from Mars, much longer time, much farther distance. So. Yes. So this is actually in our neighborhood. <laughs> so to speak. So to, so to speak. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Oh, got one. Come on. Hi, I actually have two. My name's Lee also. Um, so the, the Kapton material, the, the layers, 
what is the distance between the layers number one and what has anybody thought about what are the odds that something unknown goes through one of those layers right is there a contingency plan is there <laughs> those are great questions um i i my understanding about the distance between the layers is not very much just like a couple of inches between the layers i think all in all the the whole thing is about uh uh eight inches thick um that that was my understanding um as far as something puncturing like a like a meteorite right puncturing the capton and going through it um yeah i'll bet that keeps a few people up at night um you know there's a lot of junk that accumulates in lagrange points and uh it's not an unreasonable concern um is there a contingency plan absolutely not there are no contingency plans for this thing everything is a one-off on this thing including the planning it's it's it is a uh this is where science and religion meet there is a great deal of faith involved in the deployment of this telescope okay anybody else oh okay well um thank you guys. Thank you. you're welcome have please please find a way to watch the launch it'll it'll be uh it'll be fascinating to watch the entire process and maybe we'll be able to report back uh in january with good news okay so um so with that we'll go ahead and take a, a little break here we got nice snacks in the back and uh shortly i see that derek is, or, or derek. <laughs> yes eric has um joined us now so we'll be able to start that presentation in just a couple of minutes. So we'll get started here. Um, I think we got everybody back. Um, so for tonight's talk, we have Dr. Eric Kirschenbaum, and he is a zoologist, college lecturer, and fellow at Girton College. University of Cambridge, and an expert on animal vocal communication, which he has researched for the past 13 years, publishing more than 20 academic papers on the topic. His first popular science book, The Zoologist Guide to the Galaxy, was a Times Sunday Times Book of the Year and received accolades from, among others, Richard Dawkins and Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal. He received his PhD at the University of Haifa, in Israel. He was the Herschel Smith Research Fellow in Zoology at the University of Cambridge before taking up his position at Girton College. Dr. Kirschenbaum has given interviews to numerous radio and TV stations, including the BBC World Services Science in Action and the PBS flagship science TV documentary, Nova Wonders. And now please welcome Dr. Kirschenbaum. Kirschenbaum, sorry. sorry about that. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I hope you can you can hear me just fine. Share my screen. Um, and this is great. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to to talk to to a uh, a group of people who uh, what did I do? I'm sure. Can you hear me? Just yep, I got. I messed up here. Hang on a second. There we go. I'm. Clicking buttons. Go right ahead. Continue. I'm just messing around. Okay. You can hear me. They're used to me. Mess they're used to me messing around. Go ahead, okay. please. Okay, great. So I'm I'm a zoologist, um, as you said, which might seem like a strange thing, uh, strange kind of person to be to be uh, talking to to a group of astronomers, but um, that's because we are um, at a point where we are actually genuinely on the verge of discovering life on other planets i mean this is something that that we are seriously considering that we're expecting to to happen in the next 10 20 30 years that we're going to be discovering evidence of um life outside of outside of the planet earth and 
this means that it's something that we need to start thinking about in a different way, in a slightly different way from the way that people have thought about life, uh, life in space up until now. We need to get away from science fiction, get away from conspiracy theories, we need to get away from speculation. All these things are great fun. I love science fiction as much as anyone, but this is not science. We need to get to a place where we can start studying the science of life outside of Earth uh, in a more rigorous way. And up until now, this really hasn't been the place for a zoologist, right? We've had um, biochemists and planetary geologists and, and people looking at questions like the origin of life and, and what could be the, the, the chemical basis of life. But zoologists haven't really been, been involved in this um, up until now. Because the main question that people have been asking is how can there be life and not so much what kind of life is there? But, this, but things are changing. Things are changing and, and we need to start changing our perspective a little bit. And one of the things that being a zoologist brings to us, it's the, it's the uh, questions and the ideas of evolutionary biology that we can leverage to tell us what life will be like on other planets, using evidence, using the evidence that, that we've got. And you might say, well, okay, what evidence? <laughs> we don't, haven't even discovered any life on the, any other planet. So, so, so we don't have any evidence, but that's not true. We have lots of evidence. We have evidence of life on earth and life on earth gives us evidence about life on other planets in exactly the same way that physics on earth tells us about stars. You would not doubt that we use our knowledge of, of how the laws of physics work on earth to understand how a distant star functions. So we can use a similar sort of process to think about, about the nature of life and to extend that and to extrapolate that to what might be happening elsewhere in the universe. So um, as you all know, this is an incredibly uh, exciting time for uh, exoplanet uh, and, and astrobiology research. I'm sure you, you, you remember like me 30 years ago, we didn't even know whether there were any other planets in the, in the universe. And, and not long after the first exoplanets were, were discovered, which of course were, were giant, were, were gas giants, the easy ones to discover, uh, there's been the, 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 the development of new techniques and, and new observatories and new way, and Kepler in particular, new ways of finding exoplanets has, has just, um, expanded at an incredible, incredible pace. And we now think that pretty much every star in the galaxy has planets around it. There's a recent paper uh, published a couple of years ago, which made an estimate that there were, there were somewhere between 11 and 40 billion Earth-like planets. This is just Earth-like planets in our galaxy. Now, Clearly, you can see that that you know a lot of these, the hot Jupiters and 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 the lava worlds, they're not going to be very hospitable places for life. But still, there are a huge number, a huge number of planets where where life could exist. Actually, there's some interesting ideas at the moment. I'm not going to go into, but there's some interesting ideas about how even on cold gas giants, even planets like like Neptune can ho potentially host habitable habitable zones uh, deep beneath uh, some of the some of the of the gas layers. But, um, but in any case, as new technologies are developed and new ideas and new theories, it becomes clear that there are many, many, many potential, potential homes for, for life in, in the galaxy. Of course, we don't know how many of them, we don't know what the, the chances of life um, occurring are. So it could be that 40 billion isn't really all that much, but we think it probably is. Um, we think life is probably not that um, unusual. However, there is one little problem. And that is that if you look at the history of life on Earth, in the four billion years of, uh, four and a half billion years since the Earth, that the Earth uh, formed, you can see that, that life probably arose very, very, very early on. Very early on, almost immediately, in fact, as soon as liquid water could exist on the surface of the Earth. Very, very quickly, you know, half a billion years after, after the Earth was cool enough to host liquid water, there was life on Earth. But in the time since that, in the two, two billion years, for two billion years, 
life was incredibly simple. It was essentially that sort of bacterial slime that you see in the bottom picture. Now, we know that Earth is a relatively young planet compared to, to most of the planets in, in the galaxy. So it could be that other planets have, 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 uh, are much more likely to have, to have moved on and to, to have evolved much more complex life. But you can see that if the history of Earth were typical and we were to sample pla planets randomly, then, then most likely all we would see in terms of life is this bacterial slime. Complex organisms, complex animals and plants like we're familiar with really only appeared about half a billion years ago, right up at the top there. So, so most of the history of Earth has been very simple. Life has been very, very simple. The other thing to note about this, this timeline is that there were a couple of, of incidents, at least a couple, where really extreme things happened to the planet Earth. So at least twice, the entire planet froze over, right? Pole to pole, covered in ice. Um, and these, these kinds of extreme events obviously had a huge impact on the way that life evolved. We don't know what. But you know, clearly it's a major event for, for, for any organisms living in the sea if the entire sea freezes. So we don't really know what kind of cosmic events are happening on other planets. And they could be changing the course of evolution. It could be slower, it could be faster. Um, life could go extinct completely. So it's very hard to deduce from what we see in the history of Earth what the history of life on other planets might be. And that's worrying and that that makes you think well maybe actually the history of life on earth has been very unusual um and and everything that, that we, we can't really tell what might be happening elsewhere in the, elsewhere in the galaxy but of course there are reasons to think that we can still draw conclusions about what alien life must be like based on what we see on earth and that's because we understand life pretty well uh, we understand life on Earth remarkably well. And the first thing to realize is that life is very tightly constrained. Whatever, whatever you're used to from science fiction, it, it's still the case that there are actually a lot of restrictions on what kind of life can exist and the, the kind of rules that guide the nature of life. These rules, they can, be, they can be down to the laws of physics. There are also rules of biology, rules of evolution, and, and rules of ecology that I'll talk about. But the rules of physics are, are pretty straightforward, and, and we understand them really well. Things like mechanics, okay? So, for instance, if you want to move on a solid surface, um, move through a fluid on a solid surface, then you need to exert a force on that solid surface. Uh, but you don't want to be tied down too much by friction. So legs are a good idea. Legs have evolved repeatedly on Earth, not because there's something special about Earth. It's not something that, 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 that is, is a feature of the way that life is on Earth. It's just because that's a really good way to get around on a solid surface. Another thing that we find almost ubiquitous on Earth is that animals tend to be bilaterally symmetrical. 98% of, of the animals on Earth are, are symmetrical. They have a left side and a right side. And that's merely the function of the fact that if you, if you are moving and if you know where you're going, if you're going in a particular direction, you have a front and a back. And if you have a front and a back, you have a left and a right. So it's a purely geometrical constraint on organisms that want to move quickly or to move fast, move, move in a particular direction, uh, that they should be bilaterally symmetrical. Um, this flatworm is, is, is uh, an example of an organism that is, that is um, suggested to be rather similar to some of the early animals uh, that, that evolved on Earth. And, and symmetry was one of the first things that evolved in animals. It's almost impossible to believe that something so incredibly useful as bilateral symmetry could be just a fluke of what life is like on Earth. This does seem to be a geometric constraint on any organism that wants to move quickly. Now, having said that, of course, there are animals on Earth that are not bilaterally symmetrical. Um, these are mostly corals and, and jellyfish, but they too tell us something very interesting, a couple of interesting things. Firstly, they tell us that diversity 
is likely to arise. Wherever there's a, a niche, wherever there's an opportunity to be exploited, life will tend to exploit it. So although symmetrical moving animals have a big advantage over the asymmetric, well, the non-symmetrical ones, uh, there, are, there are cases and there are opportunities where, where these, these non-symmetrical, non-moving, in this case, because corals uh, tend, to be, tend to be stationary in their, in their adult form, and they, 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 have their own, they have their own role in the ecosystem. But more importantly, the key point that I think people forget when talking about what alien life is going to be like and whether or not we can, we can say anything about it is that weird and wonderful things will exist. There will be forms of life in the universe that completely go against any prediction that I make. I'm sure of this. I, I, I'm sure there will be strange situations that, that call on strange solutions, but they will be rare. The common things will be common. So although there may be strange science fiction like aliens somewhere in the universe, most life will conform to these same rules that we, that we see being played out on Earth about how you, you move around and, and how you get your energy and, and so on. So something to bear in mind that the common, that the obvious solutions are going to be much more common. Uh, another really nice example of where the laws of physics um, constrain what, what animals might be like is when you think about flight. So flight evolved four times on Earth, uh, each time quite independently birds, bats, insects, and extinct pterosaurs. But you notice they all have wings. <laughs> now, the question is, is the fact that these four flying um, groups of, of animals on Earth, the fact that they all have wings, is this something to do with Earth? Is this something special about the planet Earth? Or can we expect life flying life on other planets also to have wings? Well, of course, flight is something that, that, that's highly constrained by, by aerodynamic principles. And there are really only three ways that you can fly, as far as we understand. There's ballistic flight. Um, but of course, ballistic flight has a lot of drawbacks. You very little control over it. Energetically, it's problematic. There's buoyant flight. Now, you may not think about fish as flying, but as far as we're concerned, fish fly. Okay, They, they certainly don't fall. Uh, they certainly don't fall to the ground and, and hit the ground. So, so buoyant flight is a, is a very, very common way of flying. But if you're not in a really dense fluid like water, then the only other way to fly is, is um, using, using aerofoils to, to generate, a, to generate a, a lift, a force of lift um, by the air flowing over, flowing over a wing. So wings are absolutely fundamental to how you can fly and it makes perfect sense that flying organisms moving through a gas through moving through a relatively uh, sparse uh, fluid medium on another planet will also use wings interestingly when we, when we talk about buoyant flight and talk about fish and, and so on th this is a nice introduction to another um, point where the laws of physics aren't necessarily everything that constrains us. So you may or may not have asked yourselves um, why we don't have flying whales on Earth. Um, you probably haven't asked yourself, but I'll ask the question, why don't we have flying whales on Earth? This is not a constraint uh, from the laws of physics. It's perfectly possible to have flying whales. We build things that look a bit like flying whales and in fact, there are a lot of biological processes that generate hydrogen gas. Um, it would be very easy for an organism to have a pouch on its back with some bacteria in it generating hydrogen and, and the pouch fills up and it lifts the, the organism up and, and off it goes into the air. It's, it's in no way impossible, but it doesn't happen. And the reason that it doesn't happen is nothing to do with physics. Well, not nothing to do with physics. It's not primarily to do with physics. It's primarily an, an ecological constraint, which is that up in the atmosphere, there's not much food, not much to eat. Well, we'll swim through the sea and, and eat vast quantities of krill, um, which it needs to, to, to keep its, its, its huge body uh, working. 
But in a, in a rarefied medium like, like our atmosphere, solid objects tend to fall. Uh, they, they don't tend to stay in suspension very well. So there's no real evolutionary advantage to being a flying whale. There's just nothing you can eat up there, nothing you can gain from it. So here's an example of a law of a constraint that we see on, on life that's not, um, that's not just a, a down to the laws of physics. It's actually down to the way that ecologies work, the way that organisms interact with each other. And that's something that, that I'm going to, going to talk about a lot more. Um, but before that, there's one other kind of constraint that's important to mention, and that's a mathematical constraint. And we've come to understand in the last 50 years or so that a lot of what we see around us, a lot of the, 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 the way that life is on planet Earth is actually constrained by the laws of game theory. And game theory has a huge role to play in evolution. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with game theory, um, I'll give an example from one of the most one of the most well known um, sort of illustrations of game theory, which is called the hawk dove game. And it goes something like this: Let's imagine that you live in a society that's full of doves, and um, everyone loves everyone else. Everyone's having a great time. Um, no one's fighting and uh, everyone's mating with everyone else. It's all free love. And, uh, and basically, it's just a really nice place to live. And then along comes the hawk. Well, this hawk is going to exploit the doves. The doves aren't going to fight back. Uh, the hawk is going to take advantage of the doves, uh, monopolize mating, um, and, and, uh, and, and going to be more successful than any of the doves. And so um, the, the hawkers' offspring are going, to, are going to be more successful. They're going to spread through the population. And sooner or later, um, the doves are disappearing. And the problem with this scenario is that eventually, what you have is a world full of hawks, which is not a very nice place to be, right? They're always fighting. They're always trying to, to, uh, to get the better of each other. Um, getting injured and so on. Now, I think we can all agree that living in a society of doves is much nicer than living in a society of hawks, but it's not stable. It's not stable in the face of, of the existence of, of hawks. And one of the interesting things that, that we learn from game theory is that in a society, in an unpleasant society like this one, full of fighting hawks, doves might be able to eke out a bit of an existence because they're saving their energy. They're not fighting with each other. And they might be able to get in and, and mate a little bit here and there and, and, and survive like that. So game theory, which we believe is, is completely universal. I mean, these are just constraints of mathematical interactions. Teaches us a number of, a number of things. Uh, one thing that the thing that that as biologists, we tend to focus on the most is that optimality isn't always stable. The best situation isn't always what will evolve because it, it's not a stable solution. Uh, but for our purposes, it's the other two, um, the other two points that are really important, which is that what drives a lot of evolutionary uh, outcomes is the interactions between individuals. Who you're with matters. It makes a difference to what kind of things you evolve. And oftentimes it pays to be different. It pays to exploit a niche that others are not exploiting. And that can be formulated in, in very rigorous, uh, in very rigorous ways that we believe uh, are, going to, are going to apply across the universe. So ecosystems are important. The interaction between different species it seems to be something that's very important for driving the diversity of life on Earth. Well, if we're going to talk about ecosystems, um, then there are examples of um, some kinds of um, science fiction ecosystems. And this is from uh, James Cameron's Avatar. And, you know, they, they kind of look a lot like life on Earth. So I don't know. Does this ecosystem look like Earth because uh, the creators were inspired by life on Earth? You know, the alien, blue alien monkeys and, and, and you know, bats and, and hummingbirds and things like that. Is that uh, do they get, just get the ideas from Earth? 
Or is there something more fundamental here about the kinds of organisms that can exist and interact? So an ecosystem, um, most of you probably learned this in, in school, the ecosystem uh, looks something like this. This is a, a food web of the interactions between different kinds of, of organisms. And the important thing to understand about food webs is that they don't just appear from nowhere. This, this, these animals didn't just sort of drop into, a, into their place on this, on this web uh, already made. The web and the animals evolved together. Um, this is co-evolution over a long period of time. These different interactions evolved and the animals evolved to fulfill uh, the relationships that, that suited them best. And it's precisely this complexity of an ecosystem that's driving the diversity of life on Earth. And it's the complexity of the ecosystem that will be driving the complexity of life on other planets as well. The only reason you get complexity is because there are complex, diverse series of opportunities to exploit. I'm going to illustrate that um, with a little story from the history of life on Earth. So uh, we reckon that about 600 million years ago, life on Earth looked something like this. Um, this is reconstruction from, from uh, the oldest fossils of, uh, of, of plants and animals that we have. Um, we're fairly sure that, that at least some of these organisms were, were probably animals of some sort. Some of them were plants of some sort. Um, some of them were possibly something else that doesn't exist anymore. And we don't really understand what it is. But what you can see from this artist's impression is that life was fairly laid back in those days. Um, the organism sort of floated around or, or, or waved in the water and they photosynthesized and, and um, some of them got their energy from just dead organic material and, and, and gathering uh, detritus and so on. You certainly don't see any shells or any teeth or anything like that. And this is really a world rather like that society of doves um, that I talked about earlier. And then about 540 million years ago, all of a sudden, very, very quickly, everything changed, okay? And within an incredibly short period of time, the world looked completely different. Within a few tens of millions of years, or even probably less, um, the, the diversity of animals in particular changed completely. You see animals with shells, animals with spines, animals with teeth, animals with eyes to uh, look out for who's coming to eat you uh, or to look for the animal, the, the prey that you want to eat. We see animals burrowing in the, in the ground. We see animals with legs because they need to move quickly. All of this happened very, 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 very quickly. Now we don't know what triggered that exactly. And we don't know at what point in the history of the evolution on another planet that something like that would happen. But what we do know is that once predators evolve, there's no going back. This is a ratchet. Although the, the situation before the Cambrian explosion, as it was called, the situation on the left looks very pleasant and peaceful, it can't exist forever. Because the moment someone starts trying to take a bite out of someone else, then a whole chain of evolutionary um, uh, processes are set into place and there's no going back. A lack of predation is unstable. And the, the appearance of all of these different ways to eat other organisms led to a whole range of different ways to protect yourself from being eaten. The, the, the ecosystem became much, much more diverse almost overnight. And that's really why we see such a diverse so, uh, selection of life on Earth, it's because of this, of, of this sudden um, uh, and, and, and extremely complex range of different ways that organisms eat each other or, or protect themselves from being eaten. So if we go back to our, to our food web, we can see that, that the very base of the food web is probably as old as life itself. Um, Organisms that feed on, 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 these, uh, on, on this phytoplankton or, or perhaps just collect dead organic material is also very old. Um, 
And again, it's, it's inevitable. If, if life is there to be eaten, someone will, will take advantage of it. But sooner or later, this predation, this, this whole idea of running after each other and trying to eat each other will evolve. It's got to evolve at some point on any planet. Now, inevitable predation has inevitable consequences. One thing we know about predation from looking at life on Earth is that it always leads to arms races. So if I'm um, a prey animal at the, uh, at the mercy of predators, I have an advantage to evolve defenses. Uh, there are many kinds of defenses against, against predation, of course. One of them is perhaps to have an armored, uh, an armored shell or, or a skin or, or to be larger and, and stronger. And then of course, the predators have to be larger and stronger to bite through my armored shell. So then I have to develop better defenses, perhaps long horns, and then the predator has to get even larger with larger teeth. And we get this, this sort of accelerating arms race, which is nothing to do with the way that Earth is, and it's everything to do with, again, the mathematical basis of natural selection and what kind of strategies will be, will be um, favorable and, and successful. This is not an Earth-based phenomenon. So, those defended prey animals and the predators that can prey on them also become inevitable. They're also something that, that you would expect to see on another planet eventually, irrespective of the nature of life there. Now, the complexity of, of, of an ecosystem has some very interesting results of its own. This is a, this is a graph of our estimate of the, the biodiversity on Earth um, over the last five and a half, uh, five, 550 million years or so. so. So this is mostly from fossils, of course, so it's only really a, a rough estimate. But if you're starting at the, the, the time of the, of the Cambrian explosion back there on, on the left-hand side, you can see that for many, many millions of years, basically from the Ordovician uh, uh, onwards, the diversity of life on Earth remained remarkably constant. And then about 250 million years ago, something happened. And this was called the Permian mass extinction. This was a huge mass extinction event. About 90% of life on Earth died out. Um, we think it was probably due to, to rampant climate change, um, which is something we should be very something should concern us greatly. But in any case, life was almost wiped out completely. But when life recovered, diversity began to increase and it's been increasing steadily ever since, until now. And even, you know, even when, when um, the dinosaurs went extinct, when the meteor hit the earth and, 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 and killed off also a large proportion of life on earth, you know, so it's just a blip in this increase in diversity. And the reason for this, of course, is that diversity creates more diversity. As the ecosystem gets more complex, then the, the opportunities and the, the complexity of the different interactions means there are more opportunities for, for life. And so life becomes more diverse to fill those opportunities. And we get this sort of, this, this sort of feedback loop of, of, of diversity creating more diversity. Once you reach that critical level of complexity of an ecosystem, you can't really keep it down. It's just going to get more and more and more complex. So the, the kind of um, diversity that, that we see arising eventually also comes from the fact that these arms races that I, that I was talking about, um, although they're inevitable, they're incredibly wasteful. You think about the, the Cold War, you know, we know that, that, that the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union was very wasteful of resources. What do you do? Well, given that all opportunities are going to be exploited and that the diversity is, is, is accelerating at, at, at such a pace, the next thing that happens to find other ways to protect yourself against predation is that you evolve to live in social groups. Social groups are first and foremost an excellent way to defend yourself against predators. But they also provide a lot of other benefits. They can help you to defend yourself against others of the same species. So you're competing for resources. 
with with others of your species. That's that's just a feature of natural selection. That's nothing uh, to do with Earth. Okay? Uh, they help you to find food in, uh, more effectively. They may help you to to solve difficult problems, perhaps even building useful structures like like um, places to live. Uh, they help you to raise your young successfully. And remember, what evolves is what can successfully raise uh, raise offspring. That, that that is that is what will spread. That's the nature of natural selection. And crucially. Crucially, when you live in a group, you need to interact with other individuals in that group. And that's a difficult thing to do. It's complicated. It's complicated to live in a social group for meerkats, for wolves and for ants. It's, it's complicated. So you need to evolve communication and you need to evolve some form of social intelligence. Once you get groups of individuals with social intelligence, then you start getting complex interactions, complex alliance building. Um, and I think you can see where I'm going here, that the evolution of human-like intelligence is almost inevitable. It just arises from the fact that organisms are living in complex groups. Complex groups exist because they're an effective way to, to, to be a successful organism in the face of predation and limited resources. Predation must exist because the lack of predation is unstable. Um, the other reason, I mean, it's like social groups are first and foremost for defending against um, predation, but in fact, we think social group groups probably first existed simply because um, your offspring are typically uh, more or less where you are. Um, and so you tend to be surrounded by animals that are closely related to you. Uh, and there are some some uh, principles of, of, of natural selection we don't need to go into, which which um, say that, that there's, there's a good there's a good reason to think that organisms will um, remain with closely related organisms. So social groups are, are closely related to to families, but of course families on Earth are a very specific kind of thing, because. Although reproduction must exist, you, you can't have natural selection without reproduction, you can't have an increase in diversity or complexity of life without reproduction. It's not the same as saying that sex must exist. And there's a very, very big um, question mark over whether we should expect life on other planets to reproduce sexually or not. We don't even really know why sex exists on Earth. And there are a lot of theories and there, 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 there are a lot of, um, for every argument for why sex should exist, there, there, there are many arguments against. But we do know that, that it is quite old. Um, this is supposed to be a, uh, uh, an image of the earliest known uh, fossil sexually reproducing organism. And it's about a billion years old. So this is long before there were animals, long before um, there were there, there were sort of complex life that we're that we're familiar with before the Cambrian explosion. Um, there was simple multicellular life, and, and sexual reproduction probably evolved all the way back then. But the question is, how essential is it, and how how universal um, as a principle it is? There are some reasons to think that sexual reproduction of some sort of some sort must evolve. Um, organisms that, that don't reproduce sexually at all uh, suffer from, from problems of, of accumulation of, of, uh, of disadvantageous uh, traits that it's called Muller's ratchet, but it's, it, it's not at all clear that, that, that how, just how universal a, uh, a phenomenon that is. However, if you look at life on Earth, and you look at the, the asexually reproducing organisms on the left and the sexually re reproducing organisms on the right, you can see there's much more diversity, it's much more phenotypic diversity, diversity in form and function amongst the sexually reproducing organisms than amongst the asexual ones. So it might be possible to say that retrospectively, if we were to observe complex life on another planet, not just bacterial slime, but complex life, maybe we could infer some kind of sexual reproduction. What sex does is it shuffles heritable information. 
And it allows for more diversity by mixing up, in the case of Earth, genes, but it of course doesn't need to be genes uh, on another planet, uh, but it mixes up that heritable information and, and produces more diversity like that. It has to be said though, that even those asexually reproducing bacteria, um, they have their own form of, of, of sex. It's called horizontal gene transfer. They don't really reproduce sexually, but they can swap heritable information between individuals. And that's a really strong indication that something like that must happen because even these very, very simple um, organisms like bacteria would not be able to evolve if it weren't for some amount of shuffling of, of heritable material. So probably that's also going to be happening on other planets as well. So I'm gonna sort of summarize with, um, with a bunch of, of speculations, a bunch of conclusions, even though I said at the beginning, that I don't like speculation, but um, on the basis of the principle that what I think is likely is going to be common and, and, and other stuff will happen, but it will be rare. So I think that the kinds of common things we can say about life on other planets, or at least those other planets where complex life exists. The first thing I can say is I think there should be photosynthesis. Now, of course, there are, there are places where life could exist without light. Um, we're very interested to, to see whether there's life in the underground oceans of Europa and Enceladus, and, and there there probably isn't photosynthesis. But again, there are so many Earth-like exoplanets that are bathed in, in, in their own sunlight. Life needs energy. Probably the first thing, the first most fundamental thing we could say about life is that it requires energy. That's just the law of physics. Um, without energy, uh, entropy increases and life becomes not life. So, so life needs energy somehow. L light is available many, many in, in, you know, all, over, all over the galaxy. So photosynthesis of some sort, not the same chemical pathways we have here, but some capture of sunlight, starlight, is very likely to be the basis of life on other planets. And that's not controversial. That, that's quite a common assumption in, in, in astrobiology. Like I said, predation is inevitable given enough time. Organisms are successful if they can exploit the environment successfully. Once organisms exist, other organisms will exist that will steal energy from them by eating them. Um, and, you know, even if you go back well before the, the, the Cambrian explosion, we still see some evidence of predation as in grazing. So eating these, 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 um, these um, bacterial or algal slimes. So, so take, getting your energy from, by stealing it from others is a fundamental part of what life must be like. So predation must, must evolve. But once predation evolves in animals or in animal-like creatures, um, then there's an advantage to moving quickly. There's an advantage to moving quickly so that you can catch your prey, and if you're a prey animal, so that you can escape from your predators. So on a planet or, or on a world where organisms move on a solid surface, then you would expect to find organisms that are symmetrical and even organisms that have legs. Although I was a little bit equivocal about how essential sex is, it does seem to be that some form of, of shuffling of, of heritable material is essential if complex life is going to evolve. So that's another thing I think that we can expect to see on any planet where there is complex life. And if there is sex, then there should be families as well. So you'll get social groups, you'll get social groups of related individuals. And when you get social groups of related individuals, you have to have communication. Those individuals need to be communicating with each other to mediate the interactions between them. So really the picture that I'm painting is kind of coming full circle from saying, well, let's discard um, all of the, the sort of um, uh, preconceptions we have about what alien life is like from science fiction and from just thinking about life on Earth, 
uh, and, and, and saying, well, life on other planets will be like life on Earth. No, by analyzing the, the process of evolution, the processes that must be taking place on other planets, we also, we kind of come full circle and say that a lot of the things that we see in life on Earth are that way for universal reasons. And we can expect to see them occurring on other planets as well. So I just want to, to, to end with a couple of, um, a couple of, uh, of um, looks to the, to the future because um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with a, with a lot of these, but some missions that are, that are being planned that are really um, getting people excited. I and mean, apart from James Webb, James Webb, of course, is getting everyone excited as well. But um, you may know there are, there are a number of missions planned or at least in the planning stages to um, both Europa and Enceladus. These are moons of um, Jupiter and Saturn that we know have underground oceans of liquid water. So underneath a, ve underneath a very thick crust of, of, of ice, the water is liquid. Now, there's energy there, there's geothermal energy, there's energy from tidal friction orbiting these, these, these massive planets. So there's a lot of, 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 of that going on. The water remains liquid. There could be life there. We don't know. We don't know if there is, but there certainly are missions planned to investigate whether life exists in on these um, on these on, on these moons. And just let's let's um, understand how huge a leap that is, right? We, we always talk about how we'll never actually get to see alien life on uh, in, on exoplanets on around other around other stars, but we haven't yet ruled out the possibility of, of life elsewhere in our solar system. There's not life on, on Mars, probably isn't on Venus, um, despite some recent interesting developments, um, but we haven't yet explored um, these underground oceans on, on, on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So, so really within, within our lifetime, we could be seeing some very, very interesting, very interesting results there. And of course, if there is life, on Enceladus um, or, or Europa, then, then that is a fantastic way to test some of the ideas um, that, that, that I've been talking about. And then the other thing um, you're probably also familiar with is the Breakthrough Starshot um, initiative. So the idea here is that you have um, a, a series of ground-based lasers that will accelerate um, at this sort of uh, this giant sail carrying a tiny probe, uh, accelerate it to something like 20% of the speed of light, send them, send loads of these probes off towards Proxima Centauri. And, and these little probes are going to be about this big, uh, will contain a transmitter and a camera, and will fly past the planetary, some of the, the closest planetary systems, and send back to Earth pictures, um, you know, close-up pictures of of exoplanets. So again, this is slightly longer term, maybe talking about 50 years, uh, 50 sort of year time scale and maybe a, 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 you know, a few uh, tens of years or, or just a few years to, to, to get to, to get to, um, I'm sure it's only four, four light years away, it's 20 years uh, to get there and then, and then another four years for the signal to come back. This is, this is in the near future that we should be seeing a much better uh, idea of what's going on on other planets. So, so again, it's just like really exciting time for, for everyone working on, on questions of astrobiology and what life might, might be like um, elsewhere in, in the universe. Um, my book deals with this quite a lot with the idea of, of, of applying uh, the universal laws of biology from Earth to what life must be like on other planets. Um, and so I hope I've sort of infused you that, that we can actually say something about what, what life really is like. Uh, without resorting to science fiction and um i'm really happy to take any questions you might have thank you Eric. anybody oh we have someone there you go um i have a question about uh, the composition of the life uh we're so so used to having carbon-based life and uh, a lot of these exoplanets have very extreme conditions. Um, so uh, you want to make, uh, I don't want too much uh, of, a, of a lecture on this stuff, but uh, let's say silicon-based life, uh, 
ammonia-based life, sulfur-based life. A lot of these uh, types of life might uh, exist under uh, extreme conditions. Yeah. So one of the nice things about about um, the, the, the kind of things I'm saying is that is that they're independent of the underlying biochemistry. Um, so a lot of the a lot of what we what we understand about the laws of evolution there's nothing to do with what the biochemistry is. The biochemistry could be could be similar to ours. It could be dissimilar to ours. Natural selection works. Well, it works on on lots of things. It works on computer programs, right? You know, it's the the underlying hardware is is not that important. We're fairly confident that that carbon is probably um, the basis of metabolism elsewhere in in the universe. Again, you know, other things are possible, but carbon is is, is really like it. I mean, most stuff is going to be carbon based. Um, it, you know, pe people sometimes forget that 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 water is like really, really, really common in the universe. This is not something weird about Earth. There's water everywhere, uh, ammonia everywhere. The, these, these compounds are around um, and, are, and are probably quite, quite likely. Um, sulfur is very interesting, particularly with, the, with the, this uh, phosphine discovery on Venus, which, which I didn't talk about too much. Uh, we could talk about some more. Um, so that was really a bit of a wake up call for people to start thinking about other metabolisms. Um, silicon seems like a non-starter. There doesn't seem to be any real way that, that, we, can, that we can see that that could, that could be the basis of a complex metabolism. But what is really interesting is when you think about Titan, um, okay, so Titan, of course, has oceans, it has rivers, it has mountains eroded by rivers, it has snow, it has all of these sort of hydrological features, but at minus 200 degrees, this is all liquid methane and ethane. So some people have thought, well, could that be the, ba the basis of, of, of life? Um, and although, you know, we know that life needs, to ex needs liquid to exist because chemical reactions don't really take place significantly in, in solids or gases. So you need some sort of liquid. Um, but ag again, at minus 200 degrees, any chemical reactions are going to be really, really, really slow. Uh, so there could be a metabolism based on, on these hydrocarbons, but it seems really unlikely that it would evolve into life in any appreciable um, time period. Uh, so, so people really are concentrating on the kinds of um, chemistries that we that we know and that we're familiar with, uh, although certainly other things are possible. But again, I go back to my principle is that you know, everything is possible, that everything's possible will occur, but the, the, the obvious stuff is gonna be more common. Question from the floor here too. Mark. Hello, uh, my name is Michael. I was curious to see, do you think there could be a planet uh, with multiple species with human-like intelligence? <laughs> um, okay, so that, that, is a, that is a really interesting question. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a problem. So, so there is a principle uh, in evolutionary theory con called competitive exclusion, uh, which says that two organisms that occupy the same niche cannot coexist forever. Um, now, that doesn't mean that two organisms with human-like intelligence can't coexist because they could be op occupying different niches. That's one on land, one in the water. Uh, I, I know that there's a tendency uh, to say, well, look how um, unpleasant and warlike humans are, and, and we just drive any other species extinct, wouldn't we? I mean, it's what we did to Neanderthals, probably. So, so perhaps there's some argument that, um, that that's not going to, to happen. But um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out. I wouldn't rule that out. I think if 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 these two intelligent species can, if they really do occupy very different niches, I, I think that th that's definitely possible. I mean, one, one's mind tends to jump to Planet of the Apes, right? Uh, so you've got the, uh, the the gorillas of the of the the military and and the the the, the orangutans of the politicians and the chimps of the scientists sort sort of thing. Um, uh, one 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 can envisage that. So so I think it's possible, but but it's certainly true that 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 competition is likely to drive is is likely to drive one one of those species extinct if they're really competing for for, for similar niche. Anybody have any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
How about a Zoom, an employee from the Zoom? I have, I have a question about uh, some of these planned missions or maybe unplanned missions to Enceladus and some of the moons around the gas giants. Like, what, what are the biosignatures or the things that these probes would be looking for that would indicate that there is life in the oceans below? So, so one of the nice things about um, about Europa, at least, is that we have these geysers that are so you can see the water spraying out into space. So, so the simplest thing to do, of course, is just to go and fly by and collect collect some of that and, and analyze it. And you know, you'd be looking for the kinds of complex chemicals that we believe um, form the basis of form the basis of life. Um, so you're looking at things like amino acids. Um, which are which are fairly simple chemicals, but um, but we know that they that they they're part of, of 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 every every form of life every form of life on Earth, or at least something that's that's unexpected, something that you can't explain through through simple simple chemical processes. So, to come back to the question of phosphine on on Venus. I mean, one of the reasons that it's that it caused the the, the sort of excitement that it did was that the, the geochemists and, 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 uh, and everyone were like, well, we can't actually explain phosphine through natural processes. We can't think, think of any, any natural process that could explain it. We don't really know of any metabolic process that will produce phosphine, but, but we know that it was weird. Uh, we know that it was unexpected. And so when you have the production of a chemical that you can't explain through physical processes, then, then you have to consider that, that it's possibly a biological process that um, that's responsible for it. So I, th I think the, the easiest thing to do first is to sample these sample these um, the, the, these uh, emissions, these these geysers, and 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 see is there anything in there that just looks like it shouldn't be there. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's worth mentioning, of course, about Enceladus a little or about Europa, a little um, cautionary tale, which is that when the asteroid that made sent the dinosaurs extinct hit the earth 66 million years ago it ejected a huge amount of material into space and that material those rocks contained bacteria and bacterial spores and it's quite possible that those spores survived um, the the many millions of years journey through space and some of those rocks probably hit um, these moons of jupiter and saturn and so we could of course arrive on one of these planets and just find earth life there could find um, earth bacteria there that, that was carried there 66 million years ago. Um, so that's another thing that we need to be um, we, we need to be very careful about. Thanks. There's a uh, question that says, is your book available on Amazon? Oh, absolutely, yes. Come on, Come <laughs> of course on, it is. Yeah. Come on. yeah. Uh, I just wonder. Hang on. What do you think of UFOs? Um, so I, I think that, that we've got to be reasonable and, and, and that there's, there's no indication whatsoever that, that they are um, anything. Um, one of the things to, to remember about alien life uh, is that, of course, it could be that there could be technological um, aliens out there in, in the universe. It's a little bit hard to imagine why we haven't detected them if they really are there now but that's a whole nother story of the fermi paradox and so on but you know from what we understand about physics it's incredibly incredibly difficult to travel uh, between solar systems i mean it takes a lot of energy there's no way around that it's going to take a lot of energy now i'm not saying that a, a sufficiently advanced civilization couldn't do it but it's very costly energetically so one thing that I think we can be confident about is aliens are not coming here to eat us, because if they've got the, the energy capabilities to travel from one solar system to another, they can make all the food they want. Right. You know, it's like we're, we're, we're just in a completely different scale of, of, of what they're capable of. Um, and similarly, it's like if they if they're really capable, if they've got these abilities to travel between solar systems, if they want to be seen, we should see them all the time. If they don't want to be seen, then why are we seeing them? You know, unless these are like the sort of the, the teenagers who've taken their parents' um, spaceship for a, for a spin and crashed it into a tree. Uh, 
you know, it, it does make sense that, that these that these um, UFOs are here and, and, you know, you sometimes see them in the middle of a field, but they haven't come to say hello. So I don't, I, I mean, I don't give that any, any, any um, credence at all, I'm afraid. There is the very serious job of, of SETI, of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, and that's something completely different. That's, that's about looking for signs and signals of technological alien um, civilizations in the universe. And that's, that's a completely different question, how we would know if there are technological species elsewhere uh, in the galaxy. Um, and that, and that's, that's a much harder problem because almost certainly um, they won't be traveling between, between solar systems, between stars. It's just too difficult. It's too hard to do. I don't know if you can hear me or not. I was I wondering. You, yeah. Okay, I was wondering if a uh, water planet uh, or moon like Enceladus uh, would have a natural limitation in terms of what type of life it would support or what level would it would the life there go to a family or communications or uh, is it is it somehow limited because of the environment. Yeah, and then this is this is this is great great fun to think about, of course, especially since since we're you know this is our, our best chance probably of seeing alien life is, is on planets like those. So there's a couple of things that are obvious about an underground ocean, which is one is there's no light, uh, so that's going to going to affect things, and and um, it might affect things in very peculiar ways. So when you think about it, let's say let's just say. That there's lots of life on Enceladus and it evolves, becomes complex. Eventually, societies, families, intelligence, technology, all of this evolves underneath, underneath the, the ice cap. Um, do they know about stars? Are there, are there astronomers on Enceladus? You know, they've never seen space. <laughs> so, so would they eventually uh, figure out that there's something out there, there's something beyond the, the, uh, the, the ice sheet? I mean, for sure they would, just in the same ways that we have explored what's underneath the, our feet, you know, what, what the center of the earth is like. So eventually they develop some technology and, and they're like, hey, wow, on the other side of this ice, there's vacuum or something. So that's kind of interesting thought experiment. Um, but I don't think that, that, that it's likely that they're, at least on, on the two, these two moons in our solar system, that, that that's happened. Um, but there are things that are really importantly different. So one is, is the absence of light. So you can think about whether, for instance, uh, creatures in this kind of world would have eyes. Now, they may, of course, generate their own light. But um, another possibility is, is that, that, that they're purely eyeless, um, relying on sonar or something like that to find their way around. And, and that also has a lot of implications, particularly if they're going to become astronomers. Right, if they're going to be develop technology and, and what are you going to do as a as a as an astronomer when you break through this ice sheet and you realize you know you don't have eyes you can't see see any of these any of these stars so so that's a, a, another odd thing uh, and then of course the other thing is that the world is often is could well be upside down because if you're living on on the solid surface and there's good reason to think that life probably evolves on a solid surface uh, so if you evolved on the underside of this ice of this ice sheet, um, then your world's upside down. The, the, when you if you let go of the ice, you will sink, um, which is the equivalent of like if we let go of the ground, we would float up into the air. So, so the the way that organisms would have to evolve to, to deal with that is requires some some sort of like thinking thinking differently based on the on the configuration of the of the planet. Yes. I've got a question from the floor here. Yeah, I see. Do you think that an intelligent advanced species were to discover us, would see us as being any different than any other species um, on our planet? Well, so to answer that, that, that I've got a, a friend, a colleague at the SETI Institute who tells this joke, which is that um, there are only two types of organisms in the universe, folks and critters. Folks is anyone who can build a radio telescope, and critters is everything else. Um, so the, the 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 serious implication behind that is that there can be very diverse life, even very intelligent life. Okay, dolphins and and, and chimpanzees and so on. But if you can't send a signal 
into space, no one's going to know about you. So there is a sort of natural distinction between those organisms that can communicate between, between the stars and those that can't. So I think that if, a, if, a, if a, an alien species looked at this planet, um, they would say, oh, there is a, there are, you know, there are folks on that planet. There's, there's some, some organism that can communicate between the stars. And, and obviously there are others because an intelligent species cannot evolve in isolation can only evolve from that diversity, from that huge diversity of the planet. But yeah, I think, I think uh, there is a natural distinction there. Uh, hello. Uh, do you think if humans eventually colonize Mars or different planets, do you think over generations, do you think the humans there would evolve very differently than their counterparts on Earth? So human evolution um, and the continuing evolution of humans is is a complicated topic. Uh, humans are still evolving biologically, it's true. Um, not very much, but, but they are. There are, there are plenty of, of, of biological changes we see over, over the generations. But one thing that, that is quite interesting about technology and, and communication and language in particular is that once humans evolved language, and we're the only species on the planet to have done this, then our evolution sort of shifted a little bit um, and it shifted to cultural evolution. And that's because what we need to survive, to be successful, uh, is not good genes, um, it's good memes, it's good, it's good um, uh, conceptual ideas. And human society has been involved, has been evolving incredibly rapidly the society has been evolving, though, and ideas have been evolving much, much faster than, than humans. Ideas like religions and politics, these all undergo a form of natural selection as well. And the thing about, about ideas is that you don't need to reproduce physically to transmit them. You just need to teach them. You need to convey them, which is why language is so important. Uh, and, and so they happen much more rapidly. So we see this cultural evolution of humanity sort of outstripping the biological revolution because it, it, it's so, so easy and so fast. Uh, and that means that really where we're going to see the big changes in humanity is not in our biological evolution. It's in what we can do technologically. So, you know, replacing body parts with, with uh, with mechanical replacements and 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 so on, and, and there's lots of talk about about what the human of the future might look like, but but that's going to be shaped much more by what our ideas can do than by what our bodies can do. Whether or not we'll ever be able to upload our consciousness to a computer or something like that, or become cyborgs, I, I don't know. But but um, that's going to be driven by technology, and not so much by biology. I have a question. Uh, your recent uh, answer to the question is a segue to mine. Um, let's just say, given the age of the universe, it could be possible that there were other civilizations who uh, progressed similar to us and self-destructed, no longer exist because of their own doing. I mean, that seems like that could be a possibility as much as it is that we find various types of life, uh, even in the microbial state. Say, for example, in uh, on the moons of Jupiter or and Saturn and other places. Yeah, I, I would say it's not just a possibility. I would say it's a likelihood. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, so um, of course, Earth is. is quite young, as I said, there are much older planets around, um, but the universe isn't that old, um, right? We're, we're four and a half billion years old and the universe is only 14. So it's not like, it's not like there's been loads and loads and loads of time. Um, but still, when asking why we don't see signs of technological alien civilizations and the most obvious immediate answer is that technological civilizations don't last very long. Um, that that's that's the simple answer to the question. But once you that that 
and again, it's partly because of what I, what I said before, this sort of very, very rapid cultural evolution that outstrips our ability to adapt. We have just developed far, far, far too fast. Um, our ability to, to manipulate and change the environment has outstripped our ability to, to control that. Um, mm. And the human race is, is most likely uh, headed for extinction in the long term. Uh, you know, can't, can't be sure about that, but there's certainly no indication at the moment that we're going to, to, to be able to understand the situation. As a society, we don't understand the situation that we're in nearly well enough to, to, to fix it. Um, and this could be a property of intelligent technological uh, life everywhere. And that, that could just be why, why we don't see anything is that once you have the ability to change your planet, um, it, you don't you don't realize how dangerous that is in time, uh, and that would be that'd be kind of sad. Um, but um, but it's certainly one it, it's certainly certainly one explanation. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I think so. I don't know what our chances are um, of surviving the next thousand years. Um, but the other thing to say, I mean, sort of the argument against this is that if you can get through that stage. So let's just say that, that a technological civilization, possibly even ourselves, manages to, to deal with climate change and to deal with all of, all of these issues and, and overpopulation and manages to protect our, our ecosystem and survive. Once you get through that stage, you can probably exist forever, right? It's basically then, then you've got the, 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 both the technology and the, the, the wisdom, if you like, to exist forever. So, so it could be that that you know, just need to break through that barrier once, and then and and then you're around for, for a very very long time indeed. But we certainly don't see any evidence of that in the galaxy. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Um, yes, sir. can you hear this? Yes. yes. Um, I mean, we know we won't last forever because we know sooner or later the sun will evolve to a red giant. So we know there's an end, even if we manage to survive all these things of our own making. So what do you all think we ought to do then? Well, I think ought is a, is a, difficult, is a difficult word for scientists. <laughs> um, I don't think we ought to do anything. Um, but, um, but we have okay, that instinct as a, as a philosopher survive. then. <laughs> um, well, you know, there is... There is um, Although I say that, that interstellar travel is is ridiculously expensive energetically, um, you know, there's there's certainly it's certainly a possibility uh, if we're talking about sending probes to to Proxima Centauri within a reasonable period of time. There's no actual reason that if we had enough energy that we couldn't colonize um, other solar systems. I, I think that's uh, that's certainly at least a possibility. Um, and there are loads of there are loads of, 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 sort of science fiction ideas about how that that might be done. I mean, one of the one of the things actually I was just teaching class on this this, this morning was that the, there's the idea of, of directed panspermia. So so that um, perhaps life on Earth is actually just life that's been placed here by an alien civilization. So the beginning of life on on this planet was was actually seeded. Um, I think that's fairly unlikely, but but you can see that conceptually, if you want to survive as, as a species, I'm not sure why you would, but if you did want to survive as a species, one way to do it would be you know, to send out bits of yourself to all kinds of other planets and uh, hope that they land there and, and, and start life on other planets. So you know, that's one, th if we can't really colonize other, other solar systems, we could perhaps um, uh, send samples of our DNA to, to start life on other planets. It, it seems slightly unethical thing to do, um, but 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 who knows? As I said, that, that's an ought question, um, not not a, not a what question. Um, I think that that the that that yeah that this is this is unfortunately ethics and philosophy and and you know from a biologist from an evolutionary biologist perspective that what's important is is the diversity of life on this planet. And if humans go extinct, um, we'll, cause a, we'll, we'll, we'll take an awful lot of life down with us. We will cause another massive mass extinction. We're already doing that now, but life will recover. There is sufficient diversity on Earth for, for life to recover after we've, we've gone. And that's, that's the important thing. Thank you. 
I think uh, are we about wrapped up? I don't think anybody else has got any other questions. I don't see any chat information. Oh, there we go. There's okay. Well, um, I really did enjoy your talk, Eric. I really apologize for the early hour for you, but um, okay. but uh, I think you're you handled it quite well and. Uh, um, we certainly enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. Everybody says hi. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you, guys. Okay, well, I think that's going to wrap it up. Everybody have a wonderful holidays, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. So we'll see you next year.